Bravik Activist Collective is glad to welcome you back to our third Artsakh update today with Professor Asturian. Our previous two installments have been posted on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, just like our episode today will be. It will be recorded and posted later. If you're watching the live stream on our Facebook page today, thank you for joining us. As usual, our resident historian and uh, therapist today is Dr. Stepan Asturian of UC Berkeley. Thank you again, Professor Asturian Stepan, for updating us. And we're gonna jump right into the Q&A because as I can tell from your background, uh, you have a new map behind you. So I think there are lots of things to talk about this week. So I know uh, we all know the US held its elections this week, but we, I just wanna reiterate that we are now 40 days into the war in nagorno karabakh in Artsakh, which started on September 27th. So it's been a week since we last spoke and there's lots of developments. You've got a new map behind you. Can you tell us what's happened in the interim? Yes. <coughs> Please excuse me. So this is an update and uh, it's not a, a lecture in, a, but it is a structure. I will be dealing with uh, three uh, broad uh, issues. Uh, the situation uh, in Karabakh itself on the front lines. Then some new information uh, in the field of international uh, relations. <coughs> and I will finish uh, this update with what I call miscellanea, uh, a few relatively minor uh, developments uh, that are nonetheless uh, uh, relevant uh, to what's going on. So let's start with uh, the situation on the uh, front lines. I have uh, two maps uh, that will give you an idea of uh, uh, where things stand. Uh, one is more detailed than the other. Uh, so let me try to share the screen with one of them. Uh, this one first. Share. So you can see here <clears throat> in this area, uh, the territories that have been uh, taken uh, over by the uh, Azerbaijanis an area that is being uh, disputed here and also fights in this area with a very limited progress on the part of the Azerbaijanis here in to the north because it's a very mountainous uh, area uh, and here is a more uh, uh, precise uh, map uh, So you can take a look at it, it tells you uh, quite a bit. Uh, and then I will give you a few details about uh, uh, the current uh, um, fighting. So the area that is of crucial importance is this area from Lachin Berzor to uh, Shushi. Okay, this is the key place if they cut the Lachin corridor, as it is known, uh, uh, Harapa will be cut from Armenia itself. Uh, and if they capture Shushi, which was what uh, the president of Azerbaijan uh, claimed was his goal, that he wouldn't be satisfied until uh, uh, Shushi was uh, back, uh, uh, you know, in his own hands. Uh, that will be very uh, problematic for the Armenians. To the north here, you see uh, uh, limited progress on the part of the Azerbaijanis hmm? and some fighting in this uh, area. Okay, uh, A lot of fighting here to the east and the southwest and a little bit south of uh, Shushi. Now, 
Now that you have seen this map, the latest developments are uh, that Azeri forces are quite uh, close to Shushi. Uh, an area uh, along the uh, road from Lachin and Belzor is uh, being contested. Uh, there, there is fighting there. Uh, it seems from afar that uh, Armenians still control uh, the corridor, but there are places where there are Azerbaijani incursions and traffic was closed at, in a particular location, so far as I know, at least for uh, civilians. Uh, there is also uh, uh, battles around uh, Marduni, uh, and uh, the overall picture, it would seem, uh, uh, over, uh, I mean, this morning is that uh, the attempts at uh, controlling uh, the Lachin Berzor uh, uh, corridor uh, have been stopped by Armenian forces. And uh, there has been little Azerbaijani progress towards uh, Shushi. Uh, final point about the fighting. Uh, already uh, uh, winter weather is starting in that area. At this point, drizzle, low cloud and fogs, uh, rain and snow are predicted uh, over the next uh, 10 days, uh, 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 fog and, uh, uh, you know, low clouds and so on uh, will make it more difficult, I suspect, for some of the drones, if not all of them, uh, to operate uh, efficiently. And final point. Uh, there was something uh, quite surprising uh, the, in the area of Keral Kunik, that is in one day, uh, uh, four Azerbaijani drones uh, fell. Uh, I am using uh, the verb uh, to fall uh, because it's not clear whether they were shot down or uh, whether uh, they fell because of some other uh, technological uh, trick. So uh, that indicates that maybe something new was uh, um, integrated uh, into the Armenian army, but uh, that uh, I don't know for sure. Now let's go to the second part of this uh, 10, uh, 13 minute uh, update, uh, and then we can move to the questions. Uh, the international part, uh, there have been some uh, clarifications, very significant clarifications, I would say, over uh, the past uh, week. Uh, the most important one is that the position of Iran now is uh, crystal clear. And as you know, Iran is the only uh, uh, overall friendly power uh, that has a border with Armenia. Uh, Armenia is totally landlocked and uh, um, Georgia is letting uh, trucks, uh, airplanes uh, fly and the trucks uh, cross its territory uh, with uh, quote unquote humanitarian relief materials. Uh, the northern uh, um, Georgian crossing place from Russia has uh, uh, traffic backed up over six, seven kilometers, sometimes trucks going to Armenia. So basically Armenia, the only border that, uh, that is uh, open, even though endangered lately, uh, is the border of Merli with Iraq. So this having been said, uh, Iran has uh, very uh, much uh, uh, clarified its position about this conflict. It, is, it has uh, stated that its red line uh, is a change of the borders 
What that means is that Iran uh, will not tolerate anything that affects uh, the Armenian-Iranian uh, border, the area of uh, Mehri. Of course, the Azerbaijani or Armenian controlled territory Iranian border and uh, the area of Nakhicheva. It has amassed uh, a, a lot of troops on the Iranian side of the border uh, with also uh, anti aerial weapons and everything. And basically, it is clearly indicating to uh, Turkey. Uh, and therefore to Azerbaijan that it is uh, ready to fight if the red line is crossed. On the other hand, Iran and several very high officials have clearly stated that uh, the Armenian controlled territories outside mountainous Karabakh itself have to be uh, returned to Azerbaijan. Russia has adopted openly also the same uh, position that uh, those uh, Armenian te uh, controlled territories, some of which now have been taken over uh, by the Azerbaijanis to the south mostly, have to be returned to uh, Azerbaijan. And this seems also to be the position of the uh, Minsk group uh, negotiators in uh, general. So that indicates uh, uh, something very important uh, for the uh, future. Second point, uh, I read a piece of information to the effect that uh, a few weeks ago, it was Great Britain who uh, th that uh, blocked a Security Council resolution uh, at the United uh, Nations. Uh, that resolution in particular, it was indicated, but I have no means of checking it independently. So I want to be uh, cautious. Uh, included a, a strong statement about the intervention of outside uh, powers in this conflict, that is uh, basically uh, Turkey. Uh, uh, the Times of London also published uh, almost a year ago an article about uh, Britain selling uh, white phosphorus to Turkey that was being used against uh, uh, the Kurds. Uh, the use of uh, the same type of phosphorus in Azerbaijan uh, against uh, both against forests and uh, also uh, uh, the, the, the military, uh, uh, you know, uh, would uh, require us to think uh, about uh, the origin of uh, that type of argument uh, falling into the hands of the Azerbaijanis. <clears throat> Third point, the head of the uh, Foreign Intelligence Service of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, that foreign intelligence service is called SVR. Uh, Mr. Sergei Narishkin uh, has also indicated uh, uh, that uh, the secret services of Turkey are directly involved in this conflict. So in addition to the uh, 600 uh, high level officers, uh, uh, people managing drones, airplanes, and so on. You have, uh, and uh, the uh, special force regiment uh, specialized in mountain fighting uh, brought from uh, Kurdistan. Uh, now we have also evidence of secret service, which is uh, corroborated by uh, another Russian source, which tends to be very accurate. He goes by the uh, pseudonym of War Gonzo on Telegram. Uh, and uh, War Gonzo indicated that uh, the Turkish Secret Service wants to get rid of uh, Azerbaijani officers, uh, Russian trained Azerbaijani officers or Soviet and Russian trained. And 
just a couple of days ago, uh, the Minister of Defense of Azerbaijan, uh, Mr. General Zakir Hassanov, uh, was dismissed. So you might remember that uh, several weeks ago, it was the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, now you have the Minister of Defense. Prior to that, you had problems uh, with the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, uh, all that tends to indicate essentially that uh, uh, it, it is literally Turkey uh, leading uh, the war effort and uh, uh, taking over the Ministry of Defense of uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, there are rumors that Shiite officers are not happy and so on. Uh, they cannot be ascertained independently. Uh, uh, but uh, this is uh, what's uh, going on. Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, some drones uh, fell to the north of Armenia, and they seem also to be uh, less active over the past two days. Uh, uh, in mountainous Karabakh uh, itself. Uh, I don't know what uh, the cause of that uh, might be, but it's something that is a, a little bit uh, noticeable. All of these having been uh, uh, said, uh, let's go to the third part, uh, miscellanea. Uh, miscellanea, I will start with the most important thing that came to my attention four or five days ago. Uh, uh, it's one of those topics that doesn't exist uh, in the media, even in the best newspapers. There are two hidden topics that have disappeared from uh, this, uh, uh, the attention of our uh, distinguished international journalists. Okay. Uh, the first one is that you are going to find very uh, few articles uh, really dealing with the uh, Islamists uh, imported by uh, Turkey into uh, this uh, conflict. Of course, uh, these uh, uh, Islamists were uh, yesterday's uh, Islam moderates, uh, because they, they would only cut heads. Uh, in the press, American press, uh, they were referred to as moderates, the moderates. Uh, uh, so it is very interesting how uh, things uh, disappear. The second issue that uh, I have seen, very, I have read very few articles about it is, that uh, T Turkey is a NATO member and is involved in uh, this conflict. The Secretary General of NATO, uh, you know, he, he looks like a nice guy, Mr. Stoltenberg, said that Turkey has nothing to do uh, with this conflict. Uh, I don't know if France could start a war somewhere and uh, have nothing to do with NATO, over, even though it is a member. Uh, and then there are more disturbing pieces of information. Uh, one source that is extremely knowledgeable, but goes uh, under, uh, you know, appears under a pseudonym. But uh, whatever I have read from that source uh, has turned out to be uh, accurate. Uh, has indicated uh, that actually the success of the drones used. Uh, by the Azerbaijanis uh, comes from uh, relies on the information provided by uh, uh, Turkish AVAX, you know, uh, monitoring planes, uh, airplanes, okay? And in turn that those AWAX airplanes, uh, they are uh, ba basically uh, relying on uh, the uh, monitoring and geolocation system of NATO, which apparently in the, they know it covers around 400 kilometer based on the type of plane and so on. So uh, 
if all of this is true, and I believe it is personally, even though I am not a specialist of uh, that particular field, uh, 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 then it is outright disingenuous to say that uh, NATO has uh, uh, literally nothing to do with this. And actually, no, NATO has, uh, has not even uh, expressed a mild, uh, very mild diplomatic dissatisfaction with, with, with what is going on. So uh, uh, that also is a good indication, I believe, of uh, what's uh, going on. My sense is that some people are very happy with this, uh, because if Turkey is successful, um, uh, of course, Russia is going to lose its influence in the South Caucasus, and their plan has always been to uh, create instability in that area, but even more so in the North Caucasus. So the importation of those terrorists, the war, uh, and so on, uh, all that, uh, I think, serves uh, uh, a goal uh, that has been a long-standing goal, uh, on the part of some uh, Western uh, powers. Uh, uh, let's move to uh, the third topic, uh, the two topics that have disappeared from uh, uh, the media's attention. You know, we covered it, the so-called uh, Islamist, the NATO uh, linkage to the issue. Uh, let's go a little bit to Armenia. Uh, over the past five, six days, uh, uh, a report was published by an unknown uh, think tank, uh, supposedly, uh, suggesting that uh, Pashinyan should, uh, be, you know, resign or be, uh, be basically uh, dismissed, uh, uh, be given uh, security guarantees, which uh, some people might understand, might understand also as an implied uh, uh, threat uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, pro-Russian uh, politicians should come back uh, with the support of the army, presumably. Um, uh, in that thing, I saw the name of Mr. Vanetian, who used to be the head of the uh, uh, security services of Armenia uh, before he was dismissed by uh, uh, Pashinyan. Uh, these, uh, what this uh, supposedly think tank report is stating is a variation on the theme that I mentioned last time, those uh, 14 parties declaration about some kind of national salvation body with uh, decision making authority, uh, bringing back the previous leaders and so on. Uh, uh, it's a variation on that uh, theme. And then uh, I believe it was two days ago, a bunch of uh, uh, quote unquote intellectuals and uh, uh, academics have signed the petition. Again, another variation uh, uh, on the same theme, uh, calling for some kind of uh, body of national unity uh, and so on. Um, uh, so again, it's uh, a modified version of those parties' uh, uh, declaration. Uh, all of this in time of uh, war. Uh, and uh, 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 as I mentioned also last week, I don't think uh, that would be tolerated uh, in time of war in France or uh, the United States or uh, Russia or uh, anywhere uh, else. Uh, third or fourth uh, development among the miscellanea. Uh, uh, over the past week, uh, two diaspora intellectuals, uh, one of whom uh, was also a high official under Levon der Bedrosian, uh, Dr. Girard Libaridian, uh, uh, the second one, a very distinguished uh, professor at the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Ronald Suni, uh, have published uh, articles uh, uh, 
Dr. Libaridian in the Mirror Spectator and uh, uh, Professor Xuni in Agos in uh, Turkey. Uh, those articles have received, um, uh, have appeared in uh, Azerbaijani uh, uh, media without uh, condemnation and so on. Uh, the, which indicates indirectly that they, they, they were uh, uh, welcomed. And uh, final point, I have already talked longer than uh, the agreed upon 10 uh, or 15 minutes or something. Uh, final point, uh, the uh, American company Garmin, you know, uh, which makes things for navigation. There was a time years ago uh, before advanced cell phones, you know, you had to put a Garmin in your car for driving directions and so on. I have one that is useless now. Uh, uh, has apparently stopped selling its uh, products used uh, in the Bayraktar Turkish drones, has stopped selling them uh, to Turkey. Uh, so that makes another American company uh, uh, that has stopped selling them to Turkey. You remember a Canadian company was uh, selling something else. I believe it was special cameras or something. Uh, so basically some key components of that Bayraktar, which has been touted as a remarkable Turkish achievement, technological achievement. Uh, you know, they are not getting the new pieces. When you look into the background of that Bayraktar drone, actually, and I, I did that again, I'm not a specialist in that field, but I, I really looked into the Bayraktar. Actually, uh, almost all of the key components of that drone uh, are made up by uh, uh, foreign countries, not by Turkey. So the Bayraktar is just like a, a Lego or a puzzle. I mean, it is assembled uh, by the Turks overall, but the key components are not uh, Turkish uh, at all. Uh, and to claim that this is a remarkable uh, achievement and so on is a little bit uh, far-fetched, even though it's very clear that uh, uh, that drone has been uh, devastating in the course of these uh, conflicts. So I believe now that uh, these are uh, the things uh, that uh, are relatively new or totally new and that have occurred over the past uh, week, Lisa. Thank, thank you for that uh, very thorough update of what happened in the last week. Lots and lots of developments, um, both internationally and domestically in the region. Uh, you also mentioned even things like corporate responsibility, which I think is a very interesting um, move on the part of Garmin and hopefully other, uh, we will see that also continue with other companies. So there are a few questions I wanted to ask, but you covered a lot today. So in your, um, let me see. So actually here's a question that uh, I'm curious about and it came to us from one of our viewers. Have there been any developments in the movement to recognize Artsakh recently? And what about Armenia recognizing Artsakh? Is that an option? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, cities, sometimes regions in Europe uh, or in the US have uh, recognized Artsakh's independence. Okay, well, uh, my question is, why would I care? Why would I care about that? It's totally irrelevant, okay? The only thing that counts is state recognition. Whether a Catalonian uh, small town uh, or Glendale have uh, recognized Artsakh, uh, well, I have recognized the New York personally. I recognized it yesterday night at 12 p.m. Uh, 12 a.m., sorry. I recognize the existence of New York. Uh, this is irrelevant. So far, no state uh, has uh, hinted at a possible 
uh, recognition of uh, mountainous Karabar as an independent uh, state. Okay. Uh, in addition, you have to know that for that independence to be recognized, uh, there is a process within the United Nations uh, with the Security Council involved. Uh, you shouldn't get a veto there in the Security Council. And then a certain num number of members of the Security Council as a whole. You know, you have the veto carrying members, hmm? US, Russian Federation, China, France, Britain. Hmm? And then you have uh, the rotating members, hmm? about 10 others. Uh, you also need, I believe the number is nine, you know, nine votes uh, in the broader uh, Security Council. And then it has to go to the General Assembly where you are required, I believe, I don't remember, but it's something to receive something like two thirds or three quarters of the votes uh, before your independence is fully ratified uh, internationally and uh, you might be considered as a member uh, of uh, the United Nations Assembly, Assembly as a state. Okay, uh, so basically I believe I have answered uh, this question. Uh, I cannot discern uh, a state that is uh, hinting at recognition and so on. On the other hand, a lot of uh, towns, cities, sometimes regions and so on uh, have symbolically uh, proclaimed that they recognize uh, the independence of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Okay, thank you for that, again, very thorough answer about whether um, recognition is a possibility. And as you mentioned, it's most important for nations, national uh, recognition, and that right now is not happening. So uh, even though if Glendell recognizes it, uh, unfortunately, not much is going to change. So uh, I have a different question now. Uh, and just an addendum, you know, uh, uh some of the people most interested in recognition are uh, 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 people living in regions where there is a secessionist movement. Mm. For example, uh, one Catalonia. of the towns, and I believe yeah. Catalonia even maybe as a whole, uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember, I need to check that, you know, the region of Barcelona and so on, eh, that uh, uh, I believe they, uh, they uh, several towns, I have no doubt about it, whether Catalonia as a whole has recognized Artsakh, uh, uh, I have to recheck it. But basically, you have to know that some of those places that have recognized uh, uh, the independence of mountainous Karabakh have also their own agenda eh, uh, of secession and independence. Uh, so uh, there is a pattern there, uh, no? That, that is an interesting thing to think about is maybe the regions that are most likely to recognize these regions, not nations, but regions that recognize or cities that recognize they themselves have their own separatist movement. So this is like in, in solidarity. So that's interesting. Okay, well, a different question also somewhat motivated from our viewers. So can you comment on recent involvement from Scandinavian powers, but also specifically are peacekeepers, so kind of related, are peacekeepers even able to go to that region and watch uh, if Azerbaijan does not agree? Is that a possibility? So kind well, of- Well, I, I would, uh, uh, you know, the involvement of Scandinavian powers, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't know what involvement that is. Uh, the, uh, 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 the person in charge of national security came up suddenly uh, several days ago with the idea of uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, peacekeepers being sent there. Okay. Uh, what that means, I mean, for peacekeepers to be sent there, you need to have the approval of both sides, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and uh, indirectly Turkey. 
Now, uh, uh, do you believe uh, Azerbaijan or Turkey I, uh, right now are interested in uh, peacekeepers uh, in that area? Uh, I don't think so. So Mr. O'Brien, that's the name of the head of national security here, uh, National Security Council, you know? Uh, doesn't he know that, you know? Okay. Uh, in addition, the indication of Scandinavian, of course, the Scandinavian countries, uh, uh, even though there is something uh, fascinating with uh, Scandinavian people, apparently is uh, peace loving and so on, they are all uh, closely affiliated with NATO. Uh, so this is a counter, uh, in addition to being totally unrealistic at this time, at least. Hmm? It's a kind of counter absurd counter proposal to the idea of uh, Russian or CISP peacekeepers, uh, or peacekeepers from the Commonwealth of Independent states, you know, the former Soviet states that have uh, joined uh, that uh, body. Uh, so I believe I have uh, answered uh, your question and uh, I would like to go one step further because in one of the articles I mentioned uh, written by Armenian scholars uh, over the past week or at least published by Armenian scholars, there is mentions of uh, peacekeepers and so on. Uh, I know the author very well and I respect him and uh, as a person, I really uh, also like him as a human being. But uh, the problem with peacekeepers is that uh, there were peacekeepers in uh, Rwanda hmm? at the time when at the very least, 800,000 Hutus were exterminated with machetes. There were peacekeepers in the former uh, Yugoslavia at the time when in Srebrenica, hmm, close to 10,000 Bosnian Muslim men were killed. And those peacekeepers didn't do anything. So um, my position is based on a, a totally cold-blooded uh, realism. You know, uh, I have very serious doubts about the mandates of peacekeepers uh, because peacekeepers are very often even prevented from. Uh, shooting and fighting. Hmm? I remember also, it was a long time ago, there were some kinds of peacekeepers along the Israeli-Lebanese uh, border or something, they were shot at and so on, I have to recheck that. But the word peacekeepers doesn't mean that it leads, no, they lead to peace. Oh no. So Stefan, you're supposed to make us feel better. Just yeah, kidding. that's what I'm uh, trying to do. Uh, no, no, I understand. I, I was kidding. No. But what I was saying more is, uh, so it sounds like from what you're saying is that historically peacekeepers are kind of uh, not really the most uh, effective, unfortunately, in terms of stopping violence, stopping massacre. So uh, even if the Scandinavians come, and who knows if they can come, because as you mentioned, Azerbaijan needs to agree also. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a solution. Basically, I mean, in the current context, or when it was uh, put forward, uh, not even a week ago, I believe, by Mr. O'Brien. Okay. It was DOA, dead on arrival. You cannot send peacekeepers uh, like paratroopers there, you know, if one of the sides, uh, in this case two, Azerbaijan and Turkey, don't want them. Hmm? Okay, uh, that's outright impossible. Now we have a long record of two or three years, hmm? the past approximately three years, Azerbaijan, you know, they were going to install monitoring devices and so on, you know, eh? 
along the borders of Karabakh and so on to see who shoots first. Okay? Which was the party that rejected that, prevented that? It was Azerbaijan. Okay? Uh, so you, you see this type of news that we have come up with a solution. Uh, uh, Norwegian peacekeepers, Tibetan peacekeepers, Chukchi peacekeepers. You know, it's uh, totally, uh, I mean, uh, to, to somebody who knows a little bit, it, uh, you, you know, actually, uh, uh, since you are interested in therapy, you should laugh here, you know, it should make you happy. <laughs> no, I, I, I am. <laughs> yeah, I see. Oh, gosh. Well, uh, so I think we are, let's start uh, getting to the end of our, our day today. So I have actually a, a question for you, which is about recent developments here in the United States. So Genocide Watch issued an emergency statement and a warning in the last few weeks. We here in the diaspora were initially heartened by the ge genocide emergency warning issued against Azerbaijan's actions in Artsakh. However, of course, we were shocked when another genocide watch was issued against Armenia using our Azerbaijani propaganda as evidence and noting events that occurred almost 30 years ago. When one of, and one of our collective members, Hank Terrio, he has posted an open letter to his fellow International Association of Genocide Scholars that called for a questioning of the haphazard and opaque methodology behind the warnings and watches issued by Genocide Watch. What are your thoughts on this or anything you would like to share about this? You know, uh, uh, so far as I'm concerned, that organization, I may be unfair, I don't know, but that organization is a one-man show uh, with uh, Dr. Stanton. Uh, and uh, the people working there are a collection of uh, younger people. Uh, I haven't counted them, 10, 12, uh, 8, whatever. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, uh, I read the second one, the proclamation about Armenians and genocide and stuff. So uh, you know, again, uh, since I am also interested in therapy, uh, I started, you know, I was really happy because the degree of ignorance, uh, the number of um, uh, outright mistaken statements that uh, supposedly Armenians have deported Azerbaijanis in the 40s and so on. The guy who wrote it knows nothing. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, to claim that somebody is on the verge of committing genocide like that. Eh? Uh, who checked all that information? Nobody, I can tell you. Uh, so uh, if there are people who respect that organization, uh, that's fine with me. Uh, in general, I have never thought uh, highly about that organization. Okay, it is not a reference to me. Uh, I know that one Armenian scholar has, uh, in addition to uh, Dr. Terio, uh, Another scholar has uh, provided, uh, uh, you, you know, has addressed some of the issues in the second statement. Uh, his, his name is Dr. Armen Marsubian, were, you know, showing uh, the, 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 the mistakes, you know, of the young guy who wrote that uh, <laughs> statement. Uh, one could go even deeper than that, I can tell you. Uh, but, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is what happens when uh, you rejoice when uh, that type of organization uh, proclaims something that you find advantageous, uh, and then uh, you are caught by surprise with an absurdity coming next, you know, uh, uh, that you find to be, uh, it is objectively false, uh, and you find it to be uh, disadvantageous. More generally, I couldn't care less what these or that uh, organization hmm, is thinking. Hmm. I have spent enough years studying the Armenian genocide, all the proclamations in France, in Britain, and so on, uh, uh, 
how much uh, you know they were uh, suffering and uh, they would hold people responsible and so on a lot of those organizations also serve under the guise of uh, i'm not talking about uh, genocide watch here specifically but a lot of supposedly human rights uh, reconciliation uh, uh, peace loving organizations and so on are serving various state interests under the guise hmm, of peace loving uh, friendship reconciliation uh, human rights protection and so on okay one has to understand that this is part of the western system of soft power hmm? Uh, it is constantly manipulative. Hmm? And uh, the same people who will refer to a proclamation by this or that organization, the next day will shake the hands, if not kiss, the Saudi prince who ordered uh, the, uh, how can I put it, uh, the cutting into pieces of the Saudi journalists. You know? in the, their consulate in Turkey. So uh, bottom line, all that I know is that what counts is what is happening right now in and around mountainous Karabakh, in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Russia. The rest, this guy, that guy has a proclamation, this organization thinks, uh, to me, it's totally uh, irrelevant, and I can see how those proclamations can be used uh, politically by uh, uh, powers, you know, various powers. Uh, and that's about it about this issue. Okay, so thank you for that answer also, because again, it, yeah, I think a lot of us were just uh, whiplash, and it is important to pay attention to where the information is coming from, even if it's in our favor. I think that's really a takeaway here. So I would say, uh, if you do you have time, Stepan, for one more question? We did get another- One more, one more. Oh, one more, okay. All right, so good. So this will be the final question and it is from one of our viewers. She asks, why is Russia not stepped in according to its agreement to defend Armenia? If we have proof that Azer Azerbaijan has already shelled Armenia proper. Uh, so why hasn't Russia stepped in? Okay, so there is uh, so something that should be uh, clear. Uh, first, Russia doesn't have any agreement with uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, with Artsakh. So, Technically, the problem is solved. The only thing it has is with Armenia. Armenia has to request uh, Russian uh, intervention. And prior to that, of course, consultations. Hmm? You don't suddenly intervene like that. So Armenia uh, asked for consultations and so on. Uh, when was it? About, I think in my, uh, it was after my last update. So it, it happened uh, five days ago, six days ago. I don't remember when it was. And now there are consultations. Uh, I don't believe that those four drones falling over Keral Kunik, uh, uh, were hit by birds, you know. Uh, uh, Russia has put a border guard station uh, in Zangezur, another one now with the flag, you know, Russian flag. Uh, and uh, it will intervene when there is very clear uh, military aggression against Armenia. Most likely not when uh, a village, uh, David Peck, is uh, shelled or uh, something in Keral Kunik is just uh, shelled a few times. Uh, that is uh, probably not absolutely uh, sufficient for 
uh, intervention, because you know what intervention means? It means uh, that uh, the Russians don't intervene with bicycles, you know, okay? Uh, when they intervene is big time uh, war and substantial complication with Turkey, uh, uh, Azerbaijan and so on. So uh, expecting uh, intervention when there hasn't been massive uh, uh, conflict uh, with Armenia uh, might uh, might be having uh, the, uh, high expectations. Uh, but one thing is clear over the past week is that, is that now consultations have started with the Russians and uh, uh, if uh, the Azeris or the Turks really feel confident and try to attack, for example, Zangezu, you know, uh, then Russia, I am confident, will intervene. And in that case also, Iran has made its position crystal clear over the past three days, hmm? uh, including at the very highest level, I mean, no, not just uh, the, the army, the, the leadership of the army, but uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. So, you know, uh, uh, they have said there won't be any change to the borders. Huh? Yeah. Any change to the borders will not be uh, tolerated. So that indicates very clearly another source for possible intervention. Okay. And of course, they don't expect the change to the borders on the part of Armenia, you know. Okay, uh, so the message is very clear, and uh, I think, uh, and I hope actually, uh, that uh, it will be uh, very uh, clearly understood in Baku and uh, Ankara. Again, thank you for that. That is uh, hopeful in the sense that it seems like Iran is our uh, ally here in this region and is willing to say something th that powerful uh, about the borders. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up um, now because for many of us, this is our weekly therapy session. And this has been a very tough week uh, for many of us. I have one uh, last question, but it's not really a question from one of our viewers. I mean, it's a question, but it's not like something that needs a lot of elaboration. What language do you curse in? Hmm? What language? Oh, do I, you I curse never in? curse. I never, you never curse. curse. No, no. Okay, so no language whatsoever. No cursing. No. no cursing involved. Okay, well, thank you for that. Thank you, Professor Asturian, for updating us on Artsakh this week and for serving as our free therapist. And to our viewers, I there want to say no thank you. There is no free therapy, you know, if you know the theory of psychoanalysis. Uh, you oh, you're, have, you're getting something out of this, too. You can't have free therapy because uh, you... you uh, you know, you have to look at the background of psychoanalysis. Uh, without paying, it's not real therapy. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Well, I, I do want to reiterate to our viewers, Stepan is actually, he is volunteering his time. And again, I want to thank you, Stepan, for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. Very, My pleasure. Uh, with us today. So to our viewers, I want to say, if you're here on Facebook Live, thank you for watching. But you can watch this recording and it will be posted on our Facebook uh, page, facebook.com slash Zoravik and on our Zoravik YouTube channel. Please share today's updates with everyone you know. And we're going to sign off today, hoping for the best for nagorno karabakh for Artsakh. We'll see you next week at our next uh, Artsakh updates. Thank you, everyone, and be well. Thank you. <laughs>